Um, we're going to try a little bit of a different game about that um, basic science through translational science to clinical science translation. And that's pairing faculty like me who work at UCI with their students who um, are such a key element in terms of the work that we do. And so tonight joining me is um, one of my graduate students, Pooja Sakriel, who is going to um, trade off with me in this sort of storytelling journey that we're going to take you on. Um, and the idea here for this particular lecture that I want to convey is that science is really not linear. This is a dance of one step forward and one step to the side and re-examining your ideas and uh, rinse and repeat again in order to get progress in different ways. And so that's the story that we're going to be working on telling and maybe polishing for you all as we go. So with that, I'm Eileen Anderson. I'm the director of the Stem Cell Research Center here. So again, thanks for being here. And my title is Rinse and Repeat is for More Than Shampoo, Discovering Translation um, in Neural Stem Cell Transplantation for Central Nervous System Injury and Disease. That is mouthful. So um, with that, taking into account that our you know, eventual audience who does come out and watch these, you know, in our recorded YouTube channel, um, may not be as familiar as most of the people in this room are with stem cells. We're going to go back to the basics and then walk forward through um, some of what stem cells are and how we got to this point. So stem cells, oh wow, this is an audience I could pick on. Uh, stem cells are undifferentiated cells and they divide by a process called mitosis. And the two cells that are resulting when they divide, we call their daughter cells. I don't know why we call, don't call them their sons, but they're their daughter cells. And they have two choices. They can remain as a stem cell, in which case they retain all the properties of a stem cell. They can continue to divide. They can um, be primed, if you will, to act and respond to things later on. Or they can differentiate. And that means that they specify and they become a part of an organ or a tissue, typically, right? And so that's how we generate all of the organs and tissues in our body. That's how we regenerate systems that have had problems if, in fact, it's a cell population or an organ that has the potential to do that. So liver is a good example of being able to regenerate pieces the central nervous system is not, right? That's a fundamental bit that is failing. Importantly, I want to make the point that different stem cell types may interact when we think about the central nervous system with that system in different ways. And this is really important to understand. So what do I mean by different stem cell types? Many of you will have seen me show this fundamental image. It's actually one that Brian made or stole many years ago, I don't know. Um, but I like the way that it illustrates it, because the idea is that it's the most undifferentiated cell that's down here at the bottom, at the base of the tree. And the farther you go up the trunk and out the branches, the more differentiated the stem cell type you have. So down here at the base, we have cells that are pluripotent. So these can make any cell or tissue in your body, right? Absolutely anything. An embryonic stem cell is an example of a pluripotent stem cell. We can actually recreate that pluripotency by what's called reprogramming and making induced pluripotent stem cells. This is a huge hope, as many of you know, for things like uh, being able to do long-term organ replacement or um, to fix the different sorts of diseases that um, we're trying to work on with cell and gene therapies, right? Where we might be able to take Puja cell and put it back into Puja in order to reconstruct an organ, for example, one day. But the cells I'm going to tell you about today are not pluripotent, they're multipotent. So they're from up here along this branch. Here I've highlighted the nervous system. And so these multipotent neural stem cells that we work with, they're tissue derived, and they can make anything that's in the central nervous system, but they can't contribute to skin or liver or other sorts of organs, right? So in the central nervous system, those three cell types they can make are neurons and oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And so those are the three key names that we need to think about today. And these different neural stem cells or different types of stem cell origins have pros and cons like anything else. So we can take a pluripotent cell and make it into a neural stem cell, right? We can drive a pluripotent cell up one of these branches and make it into a cell that's now only multipotent. But there are downsides to that. And so if we look at our pros and cons, if we start with a pluripotent cell like an embryonic stem cell or an induced pluripotent cell, um, a reprogrammed cell, it's easy to make a bunch of them, right? So that's an advantage. But both of those two cell types remain, retain, at least with our current technology, some potential to make tumors. And that's a huge disadvantage when we think about transplanting them therapeutically. 
On the other hand, tissue-derived cells, like the multipotent cells I'm going to tell you about tonight, have much more of an issue in terms of supply, how many of them we can make from a single cell. And that becomes, as um, we're working on in the lab right now, really rate-limiting in some ways in terms of thinking about transplantation. So they're less bankable. Um, but uh, they have a fantastic safety profile. And so they, at least in any of the studies that people in our group or others have done, they don't have that potential to make tumors anymore. And so that's a positive. Um, and wow, and I'm looking at these and realizing I flipped pros and cons for the CNS cells. So just know that. Um, a pro is that they understand also the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord as a niche. So when we put them there, they read that environment in an appropriate way. They seem to know what to do. So these cells we've shown many years ago, going back to work um, uh, all the way back starting in 2002 in my lab and Brian's lab, we've shown that they can produce really um, beautiful repair after central nervous system injury, like a spinal cord injury. So I'm gonna show you an example of what that looks like. On this side, on the left, is a vehicle animal, so didn't get any stem cells. And if you watch her feet move, you can see that she's not able to take steps all the time with her hind limb. And she can't keep her forelimb and hind limb one to one. Whereas this animal that received a neural stem cell transplant is consistently stepping with her hind feet. She's one to one all the time. She's regained coordination. And that's really a big functional improvement at following cell transplantation. So this data was published in PNAS, I think all the way back in 2005. And it actually led to, along with a bunch of other studies, to um, really the first clinical trial, a first in man clinical trial for neural stem cells for spinal cord injury, first for thoracic spinal cord injury, and then for cervical spinal cord injury. And the outcome of that, because there was quite a nice safety profile for these cells going in, was some nice evidence to support the potential for that efficacy to translate out of animal, animal models and into the human clinical um, population. So we see down here that there was a good safety profile, the cells were well tolerated, the immunosuppression was well tolerated. And of the patients that were transplanted, three out of seven people with complete injuries and four out of five people with incomplete injuries showed improvements, at least in sensation. And that's what we would expect because this was a thoracic injury model. So here, it's really tough area to be able to get locomotor recovery. So we were looking for any preliminary indicators of efficacy. So this was super exciting. And out of these patients that were transplanted, in fact, we had two patients convert from being complete to incomplete. And so that's a significant amount of recovery in a first stage clinical trial. But this was just a phase one, phase two A. We'd wanna move this forward into much larger testing to be able to move on. Very exciting, right? But as we got ready to try and move these cells um, forward into the next stage of clinical trial and clinical therapeutics, one of the things that we found is that didn't always happen. And so we published a paper um, some years after that showing that um, the next set of cells we were trying to take forward now for cervical spinal cord injury failed our efficacy testing in the lab, which was traumatic for us, right? We were so excited about these early studies. This is why you go back and repeat and double check every bit of cells that might go forward into human clinical testing. And this really raised some concerns for us um, and for others in the field about how um, different cell lines might behave differently and whether we in fact understood well enough all of the things in the transplant environment that we show those cells, how they're influencing the cells, how the cells are interpreting those signals. And so understanding why stem cells behave in a specific way is important, not just for our basic science knowledge, but as I've just showed you, for the potential to be able to translate those cells. Because if we don't understand what they're reacting to, we have no way to control that or think about how to move forward constructively in the therapeutic domain. And so let's back up and talk about that for a minute and the, and the things that contribute to influencing those cells. So here we need to orient for a moment. All stem cells occupy a place in the body, in the environment that they live in, that we typically call a niche. Some people say niche, I say niche. Um, here's an example of your basic niche and your basic stem cell at the most fundamental level, right? But it's important to think, especially when we're talking about transplantation for disease and injury, that that niche may not be the same over time, right? 
It might look different in different areas. It might be in different states of sort of breakdown or repair in reality. And there are going to be different factors and molecules that are present that the stem cells we transplant might be listening to. And so how those interactions again happen might be really critical for the potential of a given cell to give repair or to fail. And on top of that, really no two cell lines are absolutely identical. The cells themselves have things we call intrinsic properties that define how they respond. And um, that's true even if they're all the same category of cells. So a neural stem cell line, one neural stem cell line and another neural stem cell line um, is not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily possibly possible to equate those as being identical. They're going to come with different programming going into the system. And so we talk about extrinsic factors being the stuff that's present in the niche and intrinsic factors being the properties of the cells themselves. And together, those are going to influence the maintenance of the cells, their self-renewal, their potential for survival or engraftment, what lineage they choose, right? Do they become neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes at equal proportions, or are they weighted in one direction or another? So how they differentiate, what their fate is, and whether they have the same capacity for migration. And for some things in a central nervous system injury, like in spinal cord injury, their capacity to migrate is probably really critical. And so as we were kind of going back to the drawing board um, during this period of research in the lab, we did a number of experiments looking at the timing of transplantation. And what we found is that, in fact, these cells are really listening to that microenvironment that is influenced by time. And you can see just how different, labeled here in brown, are the human neural stem cells, how different this pattern looks from, exam for example, at nine days post-injury. So acute versus nine days, days post-injury, and different again at 30 days post-injury. And it turns out that that absolutely had consequences for whether or not these cells that we transplanted the same cell line, just at different times post-injury, were capable of yielding repair. So that failed acutely after injury, but these cells were capable of doing that at more subacute or chronic times post-injury. And the question that we wanted to understand was why? Pooja. Um, one of the biggest things to consider when we're talking about these different time points, I think, is the complexity of the spinal cord injury microenvironment that exists inherently based on what we're looking at. And so within the spinal cord injury site, we have all of the cells that exist within the central nervous system. And so here we have a little animated figure of what that would look like. And first and foremost, we have neurons, which are these guys right here that go along the length of your entire spinal cord and in an injury, um, they might get disrupted, um, affecting the connectivity and thus affecting motor function or sensation. And so when neurons die, they release a lot of factors that will influence all of the cells around them. Um, in addition to neurons, we also have oligodendrocytes, which are cells that myelinate axons, um, essentially meaning they ensheath the axon in a covering that helps the signal propagate a little bit faster. Um, so oligodendrocytes are there. In addition to astrocytes, which are these um, cells with a lot of processes, kind of star-shaped, that divide really, really rapidly in response to the injury to help create essentially a scar around the lesion site. And so just like a scar that happens on your skin in response to a cut, these cells kind of help hold in all of the damage and keep it from spreading out throughout. And then lastly, within the central nervous system, we also have these cells called microglia, which are the inherent um, immune cells within your central nervous system. And so these cells also proliferate really rapidly in response to the injury, um, and they help create this scar as well to contain the lesion site, but they also release a lot of pro-inflammatory factors that create kind of a very inflammatory um, response where the injury site is. Um, in addition to the central nervous system, cells, after an injury, we have a breakage in the blood-brain barrier. So in your healthy, intact central nervous system, you don't really see these immune cells. But after an injury, when that barrier is disrupted, you see an influx of neutrophils, macrophages, and T cells, which are all part of your immune response that live in the blood. And so all of these cells rush in and create kind of a more complex microenvironment than you would see in just the healthy, intact CNS. 
And so this complex microenvironment together, all of these cells are releasing different things that affect each other and potentially affect transplanted neural stem cells as well. And so in the lab, we're actually able to go in and um, take a spinal cord after an injury and quantify the percentage of cells that are existing within this microenvironment. And so here we have a quantification of these different infiltrating immune cells at different time points post-injury corresponding to the times that we did the transplants um, and saw whether or not they worked. And so you can see in red here are the neutrophils. They spike kind of really early on, um, hours, days post-injury, and then kind of settle down. Whereas on the flip side, macrophages um, peak in the middle phase and the chronic phase but are rather low at the early on time points. And then we have T cells as well, kind of slowly increasing across these time points. And so all three of these cell types are cells that we don't really see inherently within the central nervous system. But after an injury, they're all present in a very complex and dynamic way, and they're all producing different factors that are affecting the microenvironment differently, including stem cells that we transplant post-injury. And so this is one of the factors that might be affecting how these stem cells differentiate into different lineages, and then that's how these stem cells have the capacity to promote locomotor repair or not. Yeah. Do you want transition? Yeah. Okay. So then, like, just to wrap <laughs> up this concept, um, these innate immune cells. Um, that we quantified on the last slide are one really key player that regulate what the stem cells we transplant turn into. And so follow-up work in our lab has found that at least in part, one of the things that modulate these um, responses are C1Q and C3A, which are two complement proteins produced by these infiltrating cells. Perfect, all right. And so, um, for those of you who don't know about complement, does anybody know what this creature is? Oh, ooh, that was good. <laughs> so, all right, wow, we have experts in the audience. Um, so this is a horseshoe crab, and horseshoe crabs are 450 million years old, phylogenetically speaking, and this is the first time that complement proteins appear in our phylogenetic record, which I have to give full credit to graduate student Kevin Beck, who was in my lab many years ago and was from Maryland, where apparently these are on the beach all the time, and he knew that, and I had no idea. So um, 450 million years old. So the complement proteins that, that Pooja mentioned, these we think about all the time in the context of your immune system. That's where their main role is. Why do we think about them there? Because that's where they were discovered, right? But a horseshoe crab does not have much of an immune system, but it, it does have a central nervous system, right? And so it raises the question of, do we think about complement proteins being mainly a part of the immune system just because that's the context they were discovered in, when in fact they may have other roles in the body as well that we just didn't understand until now, maybe. So um, what we did, and in fact, gracing us in the audience tonight is Francisca Benevente, who recently rejoined UCI and is the graduate student, was a graduate student in my lab who did all of this work. Give away, Francisca. <laughs> um, what we did was to say, this, this doesn't make any sense. Is it, is it possible that these molecules are actually talking to the neural stem cells and the neural stem cells are listening to them? And so um, boiling that down into a, a really short story, we had a lot of evidence that C1Q and C3A were signaling to neural stem cells Francisca went looking for whether there was a mechanism for that. And so it's kind of a fancy name for going fishing. We did an unbiased forward screen to identify whether there were receptors, molecules up on the plasma membrane surface of the cell that could be signaling partners, in particular for C1Q we were interested in. C3A, the other protein that Pooja just mentioned, has a known receptor. And so it was cool to go looking for that and establish that that was a part of the game. But we knew that there was an existing receptor. C1Q is a different game. And so not only is it 450 million years old, 
The main part of what it does in the immune system is all about tagging debris for clearance. So it sort of sits down on the surface of debris. It can recognize a lot of different things. And it kind of puts up a flag and says, eat me to my macrophages, microglia, other phagocytic cells that are around. The other thing that it does is it participates in an autocatalytic cascade that's called a complement cascade. And this is a way to fight off, you know, things like bacterial infections, very Johnny on the, on the spot, so to speak, in terms of the immune response. What it doesn't do, to the best of our knowledge, is actually signal through a receptor-mediated mechanism. And this was what Francisca did in terms of her forward screen. And through it, she identified what we caught was new receptor candidates for C1Q in a mechanism that had previously been un unidentified. So we published this in eLife a couple of years ago, and she identified five receptor candidates. You can see up here CD44, GPR62, which was what's called an orphan receptor. It means it had no known ligand prior to this identification, a protein called Bay1, CMET, and ABCY5. So um, this is just a, a picture to illustrate that these interactions are really happening. Everything that you see here is a red dot is binding between C1Q and one of these receptors on the surface of a human neural stem cell. So these interactions are actual real, not just something that we pulled down by the basis of biochemistry. So skipping again over a lot of work that went on in the lab, the question we wanted to ask, having vetted this all out in a dish in vitro, was whether the idea of a receptor for C1Q would really hold water when it came to doing cell transplants in vivo. So how do we ask that question? We knock it out on the neural stem cells. So a great technology that came along a number of years ago now called CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And what we did was to make knockouts for these receptors and then test in a dish and in vivo how that changed how they respond to the environment. So I'm skipping all of, over all of the in a dish stuff and just talking about what happens when you eliminate those target receptors in terms of neural stem cell behavior. Shown here is one of these, CD44. And in this panel on the left, this is a situation where it's wild type, so these cells have the receptor. Everything that you see labeled in brown is a human neural stem cell. This is at the lesion epicenter, and just like the picture I showed you earlier, these cells get attracted into the epicenter and they sort of get stuck there. And in fact, in this situation, in an acute transplant, these cells fail to give locomotor repair, as we just talked about. But if we make a CD44 knockout, in fact, it completely abrogates that response. The cells are still here. They've just migrated out and away and taken on different fates rather than getting directed towards just one at the lesion epicenter. We can show that here quantitatively. And most importantly, making that change, so knocking out that receptor in the neural stem cells that we transplant releases their capacity, it restores or rescues their capacity to give functional locomotor repair. So the wild types fail, but the knockouts succeed. And that's pretty exciting because that gives us one lead towards how can we control these interactions between the cells we transplant and the microenvironment that they're listening to after injury. So, and this is a place that I, I want to pause for a second and, you know, kind of make sense of the title for you maybe, um, but also talk about just how science works and why we do science this way. So everybody has heard the phrase, you know, lather, rinse, and repeat. I thought this cartoon was kind of funny because programmers can be fairly literal in terms of how they take instructions. But science works in a fundamentally different way. So we think, it's easy to think, if you don't do science for a living, I think a lot of graduate students probably come, in and come into the lab out of laboratory classes where science seems very lin linear. A goes to B, B goes to C, we get a result at the end. And that can look sort of like this, right? Yay, we do X, Y, Z, and we have success at the end of the day. That is not what happens in science at all. Science is an iterative process from start to finish. So we test ideas, we explore different um, uh, concepts, and these feed back and forth onto one another in the lab all the time, right? And so you can't think about science as being a linear process. It has to be, it necessarily is one step forward, one step back, one to the side, and hopefully if you're lucky, you know, two steps forward again at the next stage. And for that reason, whenever we have a new technology, we're always going back to re-examine our questions. Whenever we have a result like the one that I just showed you, it makes us think about what's going on in the lab or going on in the field from a different perspective, which is where Pooja comes back. 
Cool. So um, I think around the time um, I joined the lab a few years ago, um, I took kind of a step to the side like Eileen was talking about. Um, and it was right around the time all of this work Eileen just talked about was kind of being wrapped up. And so I came in and asked, these are really cool, the fact that this molecule C1Q can signal through receptors and trigger all of these complex changes in neural stem cell behavior. Um, but I was really curious as to what other cell types might be expressing these receptors. Are they only on neural stem cells? Is this a mechanism that's really specific to this? Or could it be applied to the very complex microenvironment we talked about earlier? Because there are so many things happening where this injury is occurring. Um, is this a mechanism that can translate somewhere else? And so of this complex microenvironment, I was really interested in this cell type called microglia, which I, like I said earlier, are the immune cells of the central nervous system. And so they're one of the first responders to the spinal cord injury um, and help basically mediate a lot of the inflammation that we see post-injury, like scar formation, like I just talked about. And so in response to the dying neurons that we see after an injury and all of the um, like death-related factors these neurons are spitting out, microglia kind of change how they're acting and looking um, in response by turning into what we call like an activated phenotype. And so essentially these cells change their morphology they rush into the injury site within minutes of the injury, um, and they spew out a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are really important at injury onset because it helps create that scar that limits lesion volume. Um, it helps kind of put up a red flag so the body knows that something is wrong. Um, but sometimes microglia can get stuck in this state for a little bit too long. And so humans with spinal cord injury actually had these kind of activated microglia for years following the injury. And so at that point, years after the injury, they're still spitting out these cytokines that are not really conducive to neuronal repair. And so one of the questions I wanted to ask was, um, how do microglia turn into that activated state? And if we can figure out how they're doing that, can we help them turn off at the appropriate time point when we don't need that inflammation anymore? And so the questions essentially are, what, how, when do microglia do this? Um, because that's kind of the basic biology understanding that we need before we can develop a therapeutic that targets alleviating microglia-mediated inflammation. Um, and so interestingly enough, C1Q is known in the literature to be one of the things that helps turn microglia on. And so um, using human iPSC-derived microglia, so like Eileen talked about at the very beginning, um, we can take skin cells, turn them back into pluripotent stem cells, and then in the lab, in a dish, I can turn them into microglia. Um, I've also replicated this. So I take these cells, throw some C1Q on there, and I see, just like we predict in the literature, that these cells get really angry. And so my question was, okay, do microglia have the same receptors that neural stem cells have? Um, and so I can do something called an immunocytochemistry stain for all five of these receptors. Um, and lo and behold, I do see all five of them on microglia. And so the follow-up question then was, are these receptors interacting with C1Q, just like we see in the neural stem cells? because just because the protein is there doesn't necessarily mean it's serving the same function. Um, and so to answer that question, I used an experiment called a proximity ligation assay, um, which is really similar to what they had done with the neural stem cells to validate that these interactions were happening. And so here basically, anytime C1Q is in really close proximity with one of the candidate receptors, we'll see a red fluorescent dot that I can go in and visualize with the microscope and even count to understand kind of how many interactions are taking place. Um, and so here I'm just showing you guys my positive and negative controls. And so we talked a little bit about C3A already, um, and it's well known to bind to C3AR. And so we saw the puncta there just like we'd expect. Whereas on the right-hand side, we do C1Q, C3AR, which are two things we know do not interact. And again, we see no fluorescent puncta there. And so that kind of validates the foundation of the experiment. And then I can follow up and ask, OK, is C1Q interacting with the five receptors on the microglia membrane, just like in neural stem cells? 
So then you can see um, in all of these images, you see each red fluorescent punctal, which means C1Q is interacting with each of these receptors on microglia, just like they are in neural stem cells. Um, and I don't show the data here, but I can also go in and count every single cell um, across different C1Q treatments and see how the number of interactions changes across these treatments. Um, and what's really cool is when I treat these cells with different doses, I see changes in the number of receptor interactions interactions in some of the receptors, but not other receptors. And so that means maybe they're all serving different functions and all regulate microglia behavior in a different way. Um, so yeah. Um, so then coming back to this little foundational image I showed, we know that C1Q is one of the things that is driving microglia to become activated. And so if we can figure out a mechanism for how C1Q binds to which receptor to drive inflammation, maybe the receptor that C1Q binds to can be a therapeutic target for alleviating inflammation after spinal cord injury. Um, something else that's really interesting is microglia actually make their own C1Q. And so um, another possibility is that they're making C1Q as a way to kind of talk to themselves and stay locked in this kind of activated on state for much too long. And so both of those are possibilities that we're kind of exploring in the lab now um, through similar um, experimental strategies by knocking out each receptor and seeing how that changes microglia function either at baseline or again in response to C1Q treatment. And so... Taking kind of all of that together, I think we just wanted to end on a note of talking about how basic science really informs therapeutic development. And so today we kind of told you two different stories um, based in the fact that this molecule C1Q, which we originally thought was kind of, you know, just an immune molecule, um, might be doing a lot more than we originally anticipated within the spinal cord injury microenvironment. And so kind of this sense of basic research found that there's a lot of C1Q within the spinal cord injury microenvironment, and that C1Q affects the endogenous cells like microglia by making them activated, turning them on, maybe through these receptors. Um, and this kind of work can inform anti-inflammatory strategies that can alleviate inflammation in the chronic stage of injury. And then conversely, this same C1Q can affect um, stem cell transplants after injury as well. And then I think one other really cool fact is that stem cell transplants as a method for um, cell replenishment, as well as anti-inflammatory strategies are really relevant to a wide range of neurodegenerative disorders because cell death and inflammation are two things that are seen essentially in all um, neurodegenerative diseases. And so the foundation of this work hopefully will one day be applied to therapeutics outside of just the spinal cord injury field. Yeah, and I think that's all we have. <laughs> Only because it's like your data. It's, it's a small question. <laughs> uh, super cool. Uh, it's fun to see other stuff going forward, so it's nice. Uh, I wonder just if the PLA, you did it in permeabilized or non-permeabilized cell cell surface only or fully? Explain that question. Yeah. So Francisca asked if the PLA I did to look at the C1Q receptor interactions was in permeabilized or non-permeabilized cells. And so are we looking at interactions on the surface of the cell membrane or inside of the cell as well? And so these were non-permeabilized cells and so only cell surface. Um, but something I do want to do is do them on permeabilized cells as well because C1Q could bind to a receptor and then get internalized and drive different changes in downstream signaling. And so that's something I haven't done yet, but. I'm, I'm thinking also because this like the C1Q, it could happen and like mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah, there's, we don't know for sure that it's being secreted. I have a little bit different question and I need to make a preface a little bit. NH, NHK, had a report on the spinal injuries that some and showed the basically cutting or damage to the spinal cord and some of it had partial restoration of the of the um, spinal cord up to about 40 percent do you have any indication 
with this method, what will be the limit, the maximum amount of restoration that we might be getting? So can I, can I ask a question to your question? So um, restoration, like uh, how much spontaneous right. recovery? So yeah. You basically, you have 100% thickness. You have a cut that either completely or partially damages. And in some of the individuals, it took about a year or maybe it was less. You got to about 40% maximum restoration, and that was it. Some okay. were less. Some had the healing, other actually had the function. Yeah. So let me explain a little bit for folks that don't necessarily know quite as much about spinal cord injury. Um, after a spinal cord injury in rodents, in humans, in all the you know animal models that, that we use, but at the clinical level as well, there is some spontaneous recovery that happens. It depends a lot on the kind of the initial injury. So we didn't talk about spinal cord injury so much down at, down at that level today. The most common kind of injury is called a contusion injury. It's, you know, if you're in a car accident and you have a fall, there's a vertebral displacement. So you get a bruise basically on your spinal cord. And in that situation, you have a lot of sparing around where the area of damage is. And over basically mostly the first three months post injury, um, there's initially a lot of inflammation and swelling. As that goes down, people who were initially completely paralyzed may show some, some recovery. And there's, it's, I think, larger than 40% of the population. It's, it, but, but I'm talking about close to people who have fallen, for example, hit their neck, falling from a forklift, industrial injury. So we are talking about almost severe or severe uh, spinal cord, which is more serious than backlash in a car. Yeah. So it's, but yes. <laughs> So the number of, of um, so you mean, I think, disconnected, right? Because right. severed is a, a different kind of model. It's very rare in humans, right? But, but the magnitude of, but of damage, have yeah. Have complete separation or, or disruption of the neurons, or you have partial. Yeah. But and about... Still lose the function, and then... Sometimes the restoration, sometimes not. Sometimes, so you have this spontaneous recovery that happens. So what you have, though, there's different kinds of growth, again, for the audience, right? So in the central nervous system, um, unlike liver, as I talked about at the beginning, you don't get regeneration of the spinal cord as an organ. What you get is a lot of compensation that your body is trying to do over time. So there's a little bit of sprouting, there's a little bit of fill-in of tissue that happens. What you don't get is reconstruction of the circuit that existed before. So in fact, we have some other projects in the lab that are that are working on that basis. But you do get some spontaneous some spontaneous repair. In the in the clinical data that I showed just briefly, um, what I didn't emphasize is that one of the things that we went after with our cell transplants early on is we made the decision to not go into acute spinal cord injury where that spontaneous recovery is happening. So all of our strategies in the lab have stayed out of that spontaneous recovery period. So the clinical trial that I showed um, the earliest that someone could receive a transplant was six months after injury, extending out through 24 months after injury. And once you get into that six to 24 month period, the amount of spontaneous recovery that happens is very, very low. And so there you're looking at adding on as opposed to adding on to what may have happened for spontaneous recovery um, and making it hopefully into something that's more functional. Sorry, Brian. Yes. Which is mythical. Um, <laughs> I wanted to point out that we did put a slide up that shows our speaker series for the rest of 2023. So hopefully Kyle can record this and you can go to the uh, Stem Cell Center website and see what other presentations we have uh, coming up in the year. And then I wanted to ask, are there any high school students in the audience? Excellent. There are so the do not pan to the audience, Kyle. There are dozens of high school students in the audience, and so we are going to be giving out. I brought a, him some Montana beers, so he has to. Do we're going to give out a ten dollar gift card to the high school student who asks the best question tonight. Uh, I don't know who that'll be. We'll see. Later. So. <laughs>
before, well, I'll give you a minute to think about that because I had a question over here. <laughs> oh, did you have one? Oh, okay. Really? Do you need a second or you got one? Somebody else? Oh, wait, we have a question. Oh, Isaac. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm on it. <laughs> um, I'm a senior at Portola High School. Uh, I have a very superficial understanding of all of this because I haven't really taken like a college level biology course. But so what I'm getting from this is that you guys are trying to like inhibit the micro the microglia. So why don't so do we need the microglia to survive? And if so, or if not, why don't we just find a way to remove the microglia? That's that's a ten dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, so they're really important, I think, especially at the onset of an injury. And so, like I said, they're one of the first cell types to respond to even the fact that there is an injury going on. And they're kind of like like a big red flag, like, hey guys, something is wrong, and they help recruit all of the other cells that work towards um, kind of containing the injury from getting bigger um, and like turning all of the body's mechanisms into understanding that something is wrong. Um, and so they're really, really important at that initial state. Um, but kind of later on in the injury, when we're kind of ready to turn that response off, you know, they, they're kind of stuck and still confused and unable to recognize that like, okay, maybe we should move on from this. And instead of like turning on our red flags, think about how to move towards like a more regenerative capacity. But definitely um, one of the strategies in the field is we actually have a drug that we can give um, that will deplete all of the microglia. And so one of the ways people are starting to try to do that is getting rid of all of the microglia that are angry at the time point we no longer need them. And then when you take um, rodents off of this drug, microglia come back. And so now they're kind of like healthy young microglia that have never been stressed out. And so it's, it's one way to attempt to kind of turn off that inflammatory response. And so they are important, but maybe sometimes get confused as when they need to do what function. That was a great question, but the evolution is a long course, right? We don't have much around where it's not necessary in some way, right? And that makes dealing with how to respond to an injury really tricky, right? What can we manipulate without causing more harm than good? <laughs> Somebody gonna stump Pooja? What are you guys? Why don't we just wipe out astrocytes? Yeah. <laughs> oh, ooh, that was good. But but I saw your compatriot here is ready to go for the jugular. I think no. <laughs> well, if I understood the C one Q knockout study correctly. C1Q is knocked out, then you have the receptor, knocked the receptor is yeah. knocked out, then you have the injury, and then you um, evaluated the behavior. Do we know what happens if it's the injury and then C1Q receptor is blocked? So that's a so good question. You're getting at a refined level of analysis here that I was not going for. So, um, so let me back up to that study for a minute. Our goal there was to knock out. So um, in the cell population that we're transplanting, we knock out the, the receptor. So that if that cell is transplanted like normally in the wild type, then it in, the, in that particular transplant timeline, it bloms in towards the injury epicenter. It actually makes a ton of astrocytes and it's not constructive for behavior. If we knock out, at least in this case, one of the receptors, CD44, we change the way that transplanted cell is responding to the injury microenvironment. Now it doesn't get sucked into the middle, it can do good things. You're asking a different question, which is if you're not talking about the cell you're transplanting, if you're talking about like in the organism, there are neural stem cells that are there, right? What happens if you knock out those receptors and, and change the timing? And my answer is we haven't done the right, well, we haven't really done the right experiment yet. Um, in that situation, we've done a global knockout and um, uh, it's the wrong experiment to address your question, right? We really need to do that knockout 
only in the neural stem cell population that's in the spinal cord and ask how it's changing how those cells are responding. Because just like we were talking about from microglia, um, ev all the cells that are present after injury have a job to do. And so which cell you're knocking that receptor out in and when you're getting rid of it is gonna have a big influence in terms of the outcome. And that's just a part of the complexity of that injury environment response. So that is an experiment that needs to be done. Yeah, she's going to be here like eight years. Caitlin is going in. No? Is a microglia a macrophage? And, wh and why, for whatever your answer is? That is a question. I'm just kidding. That's a good question. Um, so microglia and macrophages are like closely related cousins. Um, so macrophages are like um, live in your immune system, um, and they're very phagocytotic, phagocytic cells. So they eat basically a bunch of stuff that your immune system encounters. Um, microglia developmentally come from the same lineage of cells, but they come into the brain and seed there really early on in development. And so they're here, just like the neural stem cells that listen to their niche, they're hearing a lot of different cues within the brain and the spinal cord. And so developmentally become a little bit different of a cell type. Um, and so for a long time, people kind of thought microglia and macrophages are really, really similar. Um, and they are, they express a lot of the same genes, but they also behave differently in a lot of contexts of disease. And so I think a really good example of that is spinal cord injury. Um, and so I talked about a little bit, um, microglia help form that scar. And so astrocytes form the primary scar and microglia really, um, really, I think smartly position themselves kind of perpendicularly to like where the astrocytes are holding hands as a way to um, kind of contain the lesion a little bit tighter. Macrophages, um, on the other hand, kind of stay contained to inside of the lesion site. So I think that's a huge difference in how they are responding to the injury differently and playing um, different roles. And like, there's some data suggesting too that like, you know, microglia are needed for the macrophages to stay contained and limit the injury. And so I think they're a little bit smarter and doing different things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I know you mentioned this earlier, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I misunderstood, but so you confirmed essentially that C1Q interacted with those five receptors. But I think you mentioned you're not necessarily sure like whether like which receptor, which function each receptor is serving. Mm -hmm. I was curious, do you have, or just based on past research, do you have like a hypothesis of maybe if you know about any of those individual receptors already or what you're trying to find out? Yeah, yeah, great question. So like based on the literature, all five of these receptors have um, kind of different functions. Um, so the one that I started off testing is CD44, which is the same receptor that Eileen showed. If you knock out in neural stem cells, they don't migrate to the middle of the injury site. And so CD44 has a really well-established role in the literature in, migra in mediating migration of multiple cell types. And so that's kind of what I started with because that's so well known. Um, and I do have some data already suggesting that microglia that don't have CD44 don't migrate towards C1Q the way um, uh, wild type microglia would. But um, also something that's interesting is these CD44 knockout microglia also have kind of an altered inflammatory response just at baseline and in response to inflammatory stimuli. And so that one's really interesting. Um, and I think points to like the more complex answer that probably a lot of the receptors are doing a lot of things. Um, yeah, I think when I started this project, I was like, okay, wh one does division, one does inflammation, um, one did like, I just thought it would be kind of clean cut. And like, I think the answer is just maybe they all do a lot of things. Um, but definitely CD44 has been one that's been interesting to go after so far. This is definitely for you, Pooja. <laughs> I'm not sure who this one is for. Um, thanks to both of you for that presentation. Uh, really interesting. So I just, you know, when I came here, I'd, I'd read the title for the presentation, and I just, I did not anticipate that there was going to be sort of self-conscious reflection on science as a practice and science as a process. And so that, I mean, it was, it was a, a kind of a brief moment. It was just really interesting to hear that. 
And you know the way you pointed out that it's not strictly a linear process. There are setbacks. You know the sort of increments. You go in different directions, and that's how you advance. It's not just sort of one path forward. But then I found myself thinking about all the models that we often see, which really do kind of take that linear sort of approach, and it's an arrow going forward. And I just found myself thinking in terms of how well do you think existing funding structures actually map on to science as practice? And, and are there good funding models that really kind of capture the way of thinking about science that you just articulated? Or is that a real problem in terms of we have a kind of linear way when it comes to funding agencies? You know, here are your, here are your aims, here are deliverables. It's a very structured, it's a very rigid kind of thing. And, to, and if you deviate a little bit, there could be consequences. Do we need to be thinking a bit more in terms of almost like a sandbox where there's you've got a bit of room to maneuver? So that was that was just one question, uh, the funding side of things. And then just the, the only other comment I wanted to make was that this felt like to me like a presentation that really did a great job of pointing to you know the importance of basic research, the way in which it blends into translational research. That if you move too quickly, there's so many pressures to move forward. You can spend enormous sums of money, sort of like you know throwing spaghetti against the wall, taking this very empirical approach, you really miss, may miss quite crucial details that could actually drive you know, more focused, more specialized, and maybe more economical research programs. So I thought that was really valuable. So the first part is a question. Second one's a comment. Thank you. Comment. Thank great. you. Um, so I, actually, I think we could give two different perspectives on Lee's first question. And then actually, that's a great place to wrap. Wow, I made it past without that thing shrieking. So that was dangerous. Um, so Pooja has, has just submitted for the third time um, a uh, F31 predoctoral funding application to NIH. So I'm going to give a broader comment, and then I'll give you a minute to reflect on that, right? And sort of what that process has been like and the kind of feedback that you've gotten, because I think it's relevant here as well, right? Um, so, I mean, I'm not that ancient, but going back to back, going back to um, at least my early days of of graduate school to now, the funding model that we work with has changed a lot. And in the like when I used to do these sort of intros to these, I would always talk about the NIH dollars and how much we used to invest versus how much we invest now. And so, if I had that graph here, it would look like that. So just like take that away in in terms of the take home. Um, the, the dollars um, compared to the early 70s, like when the space program was still active and when we had kind of launched the war on cancer um, um, through our federal spending to invest in research, have um, really plummeted um, over time. And I think that drives a very milestone-driven set of research that fundamentally changes what we do in the lab, and, and that is problematic, right? So not my day of science funding, but, you know, a generation ahead of me, many investigators will tell stories about, yeah, we had this great idea, me and my collaborator, and so we sat around for two days, and we wrote an NIH grant, and we got it funded. And that was in the days when NIH funding was at like the 30th percentile. So almost one out of three grants got paid. Still a competitive process. Yeah, see, you know, because you made that face. Um, one out of three grants get, got funded. Now, like where my current R01 is through, for example, um, and maybe funding is sitting at something like the sixth or the eighth percentile, right? So, um, that's a huge slim down in, in terms of what funding looks like. And it drives, and I take, if I'm going to write a good NIH grant and try and get it funded, that's a month of effort for me. That's not a two-night project to get something out the door. Because that's how refined and tight it has to be in terms of the argument. And having shared study section or, or been on study section, those grants all get reviewed through the lens of what is the likelihood of success. So our risk tolerance for research has plummeted as the dollars that we allocate towards research have pl plummeted. And that doesn't leave a lot of room to play in the sandbox, right? And so what happens is the labs that have some ancillary funding to be able to try new ideas have the opportunity to do that. That means we leave a lot of discoveries by the wayside, and that's, that's really problematic. And then just to set up Pooja, I'll, I'll give an example, and you can maybe reflect on this. So I had the kind of grant that Pooja just applied for, I applied for as a graduate student. Why did I apply for one? Because my advisor said, 
uh, I said, I, I would like to go to the Society for Neuroscience meeting and present. And he said, get a grant and I'll send you. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so I went on my own with no input from my advisor. And I wrote an NRSA fellowship. And uh, in those days, those were 12 page applications and not six page applications. And I figured out the process and I sent it in. And uh, it came back with something like, I don't know, the 24th percentile. And I was like, oh, I'm never gonna get that. I'm not gonna get to go to the meeting. That's such a bummer. But that was fundable, right? Because at the 30th percentile was sort of the cutoff. And so I got that grant. It actually saved my science career later on because I ended up moving labs. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't have that, that funding. But the, the ability to get those grants was based around, did you have a good idea and did you write it up well? Because there was more money available. Contrast that with Pooja's recent experience. Um, so I think nowadays, definitely a lot of the focus is on, especially for like an F31, um, which is a training grant, on what kind of opportunities would be available for me to become a better scientist. And so we're still evaluated a little bit on what our project is, but a really big component is like, what kind of conferences is she gonna go to? What workshops do you take? Um, what mentors are available to her in addition to just Eileen? And like, where is she gonna go learn all of these things? And how will that set her up for the rest of her career? And so um, I still had to write like a grant um, for like the science that I'm doing, but I think probably what's more weighted is um, my training plan and my mentorship team. And so kind of two components that weigh a lot more heavily on my development as a scientist, which I think gives us a little bit more wiggle room and like what kind of science we'll be doing. Um, yeah, and then it's cool because I get to pitch things like learning new techniques or going to new places to talk to somebody new to learn this thing. And so um, it's been a really cool opportunity if, if I get it. <laughs> So I'm going to challenge you on that, because right? I, think, I think that's a good thing about those proposals. The emphasis on mentorship is never a bad thing. But I think that's a way for NIH to be more risk averse at the same time, right? So you have to field all of those pieces to have a competitive proposal. And I mean, you know from the feedback you got in terms of like the first time that you submitted, right? That was a really hard review that wasn't about did you have a good idea and you know we should give you the chance to go do this because if it was only about you learning then they wouldn't care what your results were right you could go do anything and as long as you learned that's a success but that's not what it's about right it's about the relative likelihood of success for your aims even though that's a training grant and so i think it's another way that it illustrates how risk averse we've become you can't just play in the sandbox and have that be a success. So there are good things to that, right, to have research be targeted. But I, like I said, I think we leave a lot of data and discovery by the wayside. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like, I feel like you need like so much preliminary data. Like you basically need like a set of experience, experiments being like, what I'm proposing is correct. I'm just gonna do more of it yeah. um, for them to like take it seriously, so. On that keen note, <laughs> um, so maybe the one thing I, I would say is um, it is, so I, I think it is really important to explain to people why basic science is important and, and, and why that pipeline is important. In California, we have this added mix of funding from California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. So we'd be sort of remiss if we didn't men mention that tonight. And that does tend to be very transactional, right? It's very milestone driven in terms of advancing forward at the translational stages. But the goal is to lighten that up at the basic science stages and enable just some stuff to get done that may lead down that pipeline. And so it breaks into pieces in terms of the funding organization where it gets more rigorous the later you progress towards translation in terms of milestones and ticking the boxes as opposed to discovery-based research. Thank you all for coming tonight. We're pretty much on time, so have a good night. <laughs>